Hey, I just got off a fun episode of MakerCast where I showed how I took this, an SI5351 module that's basically a cool set of three programmable oscillators, and turned it into this, the Hello Gavna. Hello Gavna. Now, full-fledged function generators are great, but the cheaper ones at least only go up to like 60 megahertz or so. Now, this guy doesn't make it all that low, but based around the ADF-435X, it makes it up to 4.4 gigahertz. Super useful. But boy, do I hate the clunky touchscreen interface. So fiddly. Now, the idea was to take that little uh, I squared C module that generates precise clocks from a few kilohertz to hundreds of megahertz and make it into a usable lab instrument where I can configure and enable individual signals with no fuss, see what's happening at a glance, and focus on what I'm actually working on. Well, it worked. The LEDs let you see instantly which signal is on or off and which one you've currently selected. The screen reminds you which is which, like channel 1 is 10 megahertz, channel 2 is 5 kilohertz or whatever. It also lets you edit the frequency setting easily and you can enable disabled clocks at any point in the process. Now the SI5351 is spec to go up to 160 megahertz, but these seem to have no problem going up to 225. And after some simple calibration, they're both precise and stable. So I think it's pretty cool and useful. Now I love to see my stuff out in the world being used, so if you want one of your own, I'm making this all open hardware and software, and you can go for it. Check the links below. If you don't want the hassle, a few people have already asked about it, and so I may just stick a few um, online for sale or something. And if I do and you want one, or just want to support this type of dev and content, Content, well, check that out in the links below. They'll be there if... Now, the hardware I did is just basic glue for a few modules. Uh, it's dead simple. We'll take a look at that, but here was the real challenge. UI is a bit of a pain, and I had a deadline and needed to code this up really quickly, and everything had to fit in the small at Mega 328 on these Nano. Since I only had a couple of days before showing it off, I couldn't afford to get lost in some giant spaghetti code. I, I wanted to open source the thing, so it had to be understandable and modifiable by anyone, and hey, generally not too embarrassing to show off. So I want to show you how I tame the UI and squeeze value out of every byte in tight spaces. So here's what I want to do. We'll take a look at what we've got to play with in terms of hardware, and then dive into how I tried to make the software flexible, understandable, fast to write, but still light enough to fit in there. Finally, we'll take a look at tweaks that can save you a few bytes when things are getting really, really tight. I'm definitely not saying this is the best way or only way to do it. I also made some mistakes and decisions I'd revise, but I want to share the approach and techniques I've developed over the years that let me knock this out in very little time to decent results. Now, the neat thing is, this is after the fact, so I'll be able to show you what I'm talking about about as we go. Let's dive into it, starting with a look at schematics to see the elements involved, and then go over how that's reflected in architecture and code. Okay, here's a simple schematic in my old friend Kikad. It's all built around an Arduino Nano. I have to say I busted out this unfinished project for the MakerCast, but uh, I made it two years ago and never did assembly or code for it, and I don't actually recall why I settled on the Nano. It is what it is. Who doesn't love a Duino? Plus, there are lots of things you could stick in this place with the same footprint. So on the left, we have a uh, got inputs, rope rotary encoder, and three momentary push buttons. Now, I knew I was going to ask a lot uh, of this little Mega 328 and not have a ton of room in there for code. Rather than be bouncing in software, I actually arranged to give the Nano clean signals a good trust and handled debouncing the old-timey way with RC filtering. Same applies to the rotary encoder, which has filters on both outputs uh, and the built-in mom switch. Also put in a header for uh, the off-board experience. On the output side, we've got a selected and enabled LED for each of the three channels, a general purpose status indicator LED, two variations on connections for I2C OLED display, and a header for the SI5351 module. So here's mistake number one, and I thought it might be a demo killer. I'm used to playing with 3v3, and the power that's going everywhere, including to the external modules, is coming from the Nano 3v3 regulator. But this original Nano is using 5-volt logic levels. Now, the modules can handle 5V, but this circuit is powering it at 3V3 and then sending signals that are way above that when high. Eeks! Well, I wired it up on a breadboard prototype the same way and crossed my fingers. Hmm, it worked. So I'll review this schematic before releasing, but okay, development could proceed. Another mistake I found was this. I tried to use A6A7 as digital outputs, but they only do analog in. So I bodged it up on two available pins and we'll fix that too. So how would you architecture this thing? It's basically all UI. That's its entire and only point to provide a nice user interface to this module. So most of the functionality is going to revolve around UI. 
So we've got the OLED module, SI5351 signal generator, and a rotary encoder. These are all widely used enough to have their own libraries uh, of their own, so I won't reinvent that. I'll just leave them as usable blobs here. On my board, we have indication LEDs and switches, so some classes for that. I'm using the two interruptible pins for the rotary encoder, so I'll just pull the slow switches once in a while and save that state. In a tick here, the pulling is done, and the callback is triggered if set for any changes. Now, I don't want the rest of the system to deal with the uh, super low level stuff uh, on the OLED. I don't want to be setting pixel or cursor positions everywhere in my code. So I also include a display UI element that will have some higher level functions to show various screens. Now, logically, a lot of these things go in groups. These two LEDs relate to channel one, these two to channel two, and there's a frequency set for each channel. So I created a channel type that binds these things together. Is this really a UI element? Nope. But everything about it is related to UI, so rather than have a completely distinct model that's reflected somehow in the view, we'll have a single place where information is stored, and I chose to stick it here. So the enable LED for a channel will remember if it's enabled, and if we want to know, we can just ask the channel, hey, are you enabled? And it will ask its enable LED and pass that answer back. Okay, here's the code for the indication LED. Nothing complicated. I use namespaces because I hate collisions and I usually set things up so you can call on off or just on with a Boolean. In the setter, I'm tracking the logical state and setting the actual pin based on whether it's inverted. Note that I use defines for the platform specific stuff, so under these are just uh, Arduino digital rights. The switches look a bit more complex, but they're not. There's what looks uh, a little bit uh, inconsistent in the private members here, uh, some with underscores, others not. Those with accessors uh, with the same name get the underscore, and those used only internally, I can just name what they are, like pin here. So on each tick uh, that switches, check the pin, and if it's changed, and there's a callback set, they'll trip that. Oh, and this. I love me a programmer's font. These things use ligatures to make it look awesome and more readable. The text hasn't changed. It's pure, wonderful code under there. But I think this is much clearer and recommend using them. Check it out. Wow. Now, look at this display. There needs to be a way to see the exact frequency set, but I also wanted to see at a glance what the setting was for all the channels in the summary view. You could write everything super tiny, but this is for use when you're doing something else. And I want to stay in flow focused on what I'm doing. Uh, so I want big text and there's really not a lot of room in here. So compromise. compromise. I decided that if it was in the range of units, kilohertz, megahertz, uh, I could afford a decimal. In the tens range, uh, we're out of room. So I just rounded off to the nearest value. No decimal for you. The hundreds range is more problematic. I just went with a system where uh, I go, okay, if it's n hundred kilohertz, well then it's 0 0.n megahertz. Okay, when you combine that with the idea of editing any digit of the frequency value, you find that there's a lot of putzing around with their numbers. You need to know the scale of the value to know how to represent it. You need to access each of the digits individually, blah, 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 blah. So rather than parse all this and deal with it every time you need to redraw the screen, we add in a wrapper class around the frequency value. It knows the actual number, but also figures out the scale and breaks it down into individual digits just once uh, when we set the value. Now the frequency objects use a pretty Dumb algorithm to do this thing, but that only runs once uh, when you change the value. The scale is an ugly bunch of ifs, and uh, each digit is stored through this magic loop. A little weird, but uh, documented. One thing you may have noticed is the typedef enums uh, I sometimes stick in the class there. I use this and another technique I'll show uh, to avoid polluted global namespaces, but mostly just to make my life easier. With this typedef inside the class, it's easy to just go. Mm, frequency, control tab, get this code completion of exactly what you want. Avoids mistakes and typing, two things I love. Now we have all the elements involved in the user interface, we compose a little class that just holds everything together, can be the container for the channels, and uh, knows who needs to be ticked and whatever. It's just the UI guy. So let's say we have all these up and running. Uh, I'm able to show a summary screen and channel details. I can tell when a button is clicked, whatever. So what should we do exactly? I've got one knob and a few switches. What happens when I click a button or rotate the encoder? Well, that depends, right? Maybe the enable button always enables uh, whatever channel selected, okay, sure. But turning the knob sometimes means choosing a channel or a frequency digit or actually changing the frequency. It's always the same knob, but it exhibits different behavior depending on what we're doing. So we can't just look at the encoder and do stuff when it's twisted. 
I mean, okay, I guess we could like have a mode variable and then if mode summary, then do this, else if mode frequency, edit that, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, 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 no. We have all these little boxes, which are classes. So let's leverage that OO and go beyond composition and aggregation and use some of that polymorphism I love so much. So I've got these different modes, my little splash screen or the summary or the channel details. In all these cases, we may be getting button clicks and knob twists. What changes is how the system should respond. So here's what we do. Button and knob events will be sent to some behavior instance, which will then trigger an appropriate action, like enable action or knob position change. These handlers are where behavior specifics will live. So we have a derived type of behavior for each scenario we care about. The summary screen, the channel editing, etc., etc. So in this parent class, we've got three things. Some lifecycle methods. Because we'll be switching between behaviors, it's good to be able to know uh, that we've just been loaded, that they'll all have access to the tick heartbeat and refresh method, stuff like that. Then the outside world needs to tell us when anything interesting happens. Button clicks and knob twists. Okay, so the button handler only cares about when it's pressed and is a simple uh, switch. We call knob position change if it's actually changed. Uh, notice the italics on current position there. That's a static member. So uh, the one variable will be the position for every instance of the subclasses here. That not only saves room, it makes it so uh, if we move by 300 in one behavior, then load another one and move by one, it doesn't just freak out and think you hopped uh, 301 steps. Then the most important bits are the handlers. I've put them virtual and protected here, which makes it clear they're for overrides in the subclasses. Now you could do this all by composition. Some purists would argue that that's better and have another class, event handler or something with only these methods. But for something this size, I don't think it's worth it. And the behavior would change uh, behavior depending on the handler it's got loaded up. Uh, so you'd have to call it something else, uh, whatever. In this case, all the handling methods can be overridden and I left them empty except for the enable button action. That lets you uh, use the button wherever you may be and, and actually toggles the channel on or off. Ah, here's another concession to space and complexity saving. The behavior actually knows about the signal generator it's controlling. Uh, so there's some coupling there. You could have it emit events uh, with the SIGGEN being a listener and doing its thing. That's very clean, but uh, come on. Instead, what I do is this. A lot of the stuff in here is a singleton. There's one signal generator, one display, etc. So I stick those in a globals class static method and whoever needs a thing that's a singleton and system-wide just gets it from there. Again, I didn't enforce a private constructor and all that. Hey, you want two sig gens? Who am I to judge? Finally, this is one of the reasons for a class-wide refresh interface. Subclasses will do whatever's appropriate when the channels turn on and off, and the parent here uh, doesn't need to worry about a thing. So now we need a few subclasses uh, for different behaviors. I basically got four modes of operation, the splash screen, summary, and two inside the specifics of a given channel. Here are the guts of the channel details screen. I leave the enable action alone because I want to keep the default behavior, but add implementations for the four other events. When you move the knob here, you're choosing which digit of the frequency to edit. The knob and select switch both mean, I want to edit now. Uh, the final one acts as a, like a back button. So here's the position change handler, which changed the selected position modulo the number of digits we have and then just refreshes. So I'd started writing up uh, the UI elements and tweaked those on a prototype. And once I had the uh, summary behavior, I wrote some test code that just sent the knob turn and enable button events in a loop. Then I added in the channel details and edit, kept the test code and was just twisting and pressing semi-random and actually brought the SI5351 module into the mix. So even without any actual controls, I've proven that it would all work in theory. Good. Great for a test, but now for the real code, the question is, okay, I've got a button press and I want to change modes, go into another behavior and update what's on the screen. How's that happen? I mean, whose job is that? Another question. The behaviors are being told about button clicks and knob twists, right? Well, by who? The answer to all those here is the driver. So its job is going to be as the public face of the whole system. It's the thing that holds on to the current behavior and tells that about external events. It also does housekeeping like in it at startup and ticks everyone who needs ticking. Uh, finally, it's the one you ask when you want to move to a new behavior. You message it, would you kindly schedule loading of behavior X at your earliest convenience? And it will grab the next behavior, tell the current it's about to be unloaded and finally load the new guy. Oh, and this is the other uh, collision avoiding coding ease thing I was talking about. 
I find it nice to use namespaces and type definitions like this uh, so that you can clearly refer to them in methods and have a nice code completion to see what's available. Okay, so back in our channel details, you can see that all the callbacks need to do is say, hey, driver, move to this behavior on the next step. Pretty clean. So having that single point of entry means that it's easy to wrap all this up as a library and then have a very simple Arduino sketch. I didn't bother wrapping the encoder up as part of the UI, so it lives in the sketch and you can switch it out for another library super easily. And here it is, just a library include, an object, and an RSR. Setup just takes the pin defines and does Arduino to set up things uh, to them all and attaches the interrupts for the uh, rotary encoder. Then it calls uh, begin on the driver, which in its everything inside. That leaves the main loop to just notify the driver of not position changes and tick the driver. So simple. <laughs> Yay. We can build this thing and look at that. You've got a whole 122 bytes left over to add stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's pretty tight. Here are a couple of uh, optimizations. They're small, but they can make all the difference when things are getting very squeezy. The global singletons we've been using so far have been declared static. These go onto the heap during runtime, but interestingly, this means they also take up space in your code. So if we go into globals here and define this din allocate globals, then they're allocated dynamically on first use. And look at that. Of course, the RAM usage seems to go down, but it, it doesn't really. It'll be eaten up when we create the things. But look at that. 74 bytes just got freed from our flash. Another thing is, yeah, I'm using polymorphism and have a virtual destructor, but nothing is ever destroyed here, even if we allocate it with new. So disable that and recompile. The answer is another 42 bytes liberated. Now we're down 116. Now we can do the same for rotary encoder and we now have a total of 162 bytes freed. Eesh. I had the room for, so I added these scrollers for no reason other than uh, cool. So if you want to sacrifice them for actual function, the config file has a define you can disable, which bumps out the logic for that. And there's a whopping extra 200 some bytes. Wow, we're down to 98% usage and we've now saved almost 400 bytes. Yay, but I'm keeping the scrollers. Or hey, if you really want to go wild, just run it on something with the same footprint as the Nano, but a lot more room, like the ESP32 Nano or stuff like that. All right. At this point, there are still some things to work out concerning the rules of using the clocks on the SI5351, and there's room for improvement in the code. If you want to check out that code or the little design, I've put everything online and you can just poke around or get one for your bench. Either go it alone, everything you need is there, or get bare PCBs from PCBWay, or give me some love and get populated boards from me. All with the links uh, in the description wherever this video is playing. I hope this little tour slash postmortem was useful or enjoyable. Happy hacking. Cheers. L.